A very good evening. Thank you very much for joining us on News Tonight. My name is Kweku Timin. It's always a delight when you join us with the latest happenings throughout the country. Before I share all the details with you tonight, let's look at some of the top stories that we have for you tonight. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, renal patients raise doubts about sustained operations of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital Rena Unit, despite its reopening on Wednesday, August 21. We thank God, but we hope they don't close it tomorrow. We thank God. Now, patients are being able to dialyze. Costs will come down a little bit also for us. So uh, we just pray we don't come tomorrow and the place is closed. But what really is the cause of delays in procuring renal consumables in Ghana? We shall be finding out more tonight. Adabraka Circuit Court remand suspected murderer of 24-year-old Kuntunse residence. Well, tonight we would want to get you more updates on this developing story. And on your election hub tonight, President Nana Rudankwek Fukuado pledges to respect the will of the people in the December 7th election as NDC insists it will only sign peace accord if six conditions are met by the National Peace Council. As we approach the electioneering season, I want to assure you that Ghana will emerge peaceful and more united after the 7th December elections. Tonight we'll bring you the latest from our world of business as we shall tell you how Okada riders are providing essential transport services to Ghanaians in the country. Is it one that should be banned or we should consider keeping it? Since I do, I build my four bedrooms of contain. And I have nine children. Two children are university. And four as secondary schools. Tonight we have these and many other interesting stories making the one-hour bulletin be my guest. Stay with us as we share all these stories and many more with you, including some sports updates and also bringing you some entertainment news. Be my guest. Stay with us. We're coming back shortly with all the details. Well, thank you very much. My name is Kweku Timin. We'll bring you the details of our stories tonight. And here, it appears that renal patients have lost trust in the ability of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital to keep the unit fully operational, despite its reopening to all patients on Wednesday. Well, their doubt stems from the post experience where the unit briefly reopened following prolonged shutdowns. My colleague Nadima Uma Uthman has more. Good news for the outpatients of the renal unit of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital as the facility is finally open to them after three weeks of closure. On August 20th, uh, management of the Kolibu Teaching Hospital released a press statement that the facility will finally be open to outpatients after they had airlifted some essential commodities that are needed for dialysis. And so today, the facility is finally open to outpatients who have come in here and they are Numbers. The first session of dialysis began at around 3 a.m. with some 10 persons going in there to receive their dialysis. Currently, the second session is underway with another batch of 10 persons undergoing dialysis treatment. Patients, Anan, an end-stage kidney patient is suffering from edema, a condition involving excess fluid buildup around her abdomen, causing a noticeable protrusion. She attributes this condition to missed dialysis sessions due to the repeated closures of the hospital's renal unit. As you can see, it's because um, when they closed last year, no, I wasn't getting access to do it. That's why my tummy became this big. Because that's the only source uh, that is sweet waste product from our body. So if you don't get it, it's like 
the waste are accumulating in our system and you know the stress and strain it will cause on our body so the unit is now open to outpatients but patients is skeptical about how long the facility will remain operational hmm. i can't say per se i'm happy because from what we've seen from kolebu before as we are here now it's working it's working all right but it will surprise you that they will come back and tell you the lines are finished, so look for a private facility. That's our alarm in our cases. So we are just praying that since they said they've opened, no, we are praying it continues like that. I don't want a situation whereby it will get to Friday and it's supposed to be my turn to come for dialysis and you will call them and they will tell you, we will call you back. Enoch Berkholm is also an end-stage kidney patient who had come to join the plant picketing as he was unsure of the reopening of the facility. He tells us his date for dialysis had been scheduled for August 23. My, my own, yeah, it be something as we, like if I go to private, I can't afford to do it. I can't do it. So the best thing is supposed to be in Kolebu for the treatment. Are you going to yeah, I go there, but I go there by two hours time. They, you have to come out me because I don't get the strength for the machine. Mm. This place is my second home, so I like here to do the dialysis here. If it's here, it's, nothing will happen to you. That's what I, I was thinking all the time. Major Ayinkwa, who is the spokesperson for the patients, confirmed that a number of them had come for the planned picketing due to the skepticism they had regarding the reopening of the facility. Yeah, we thank God, but we hope they don't close it tomorrow. We thank God. Now patients are being able to dialyze. Cost will come down a little bit also for us. So uh, we just pray. We don't come tomorrow and the place is closed. Uh, you heard Mustafa. Some of the consumables are in, not all. We are hoping to get the 40, 40 feet container by Friday, which we are hoping that one should come. If we don't see that container here by Friday, we don't get confirmation of them, we will pick it at the port. But public relations officer for the Kolibu Tishan Hospital, Mustafa Salifu, assured that steps are being taken to avert any future recurrence. When it got to the attention of all the ministries, everybody was ready to do whatever that they could to let us get the item. That's why we got the letter two days ago. And then uh, our logistic officers are working very hard. And before Friday, we'll have the second co container here. So we have an, enough consumables that will take it for some time. And then we, are, we always check our reorder level. And I tell you, these containers were in the country on the 5th of uh, June on the 25th of June. So, the, but for the, the mistakes in the documentation would have cleared it with, with no headaches. Meanwhile, the Renal Patients Association also wants governments to relocate charges for dialysis treatment as many still cannot afford. Government should look at the dialysis again. Even though they've done something about the, um, the National Health Insurance has done something. Um, children under 18 free, above 60 free, we in the middle, we are the taxpayers. We can work and pay tax. They should look at us. We beg them. That place, government should look at it for a second time again. All right, so definitely you would want to stay on this story some more, get some updates that you're looking forward to, or get some answers. So what is the reason? What are the causes for these shortages at not only Kolebu, but some of the public health facilities? Now, let's speak to someone whose expertise in procurement uh, for a conversation on this development. Dr. John Poor has now joined us via Zoom. Doc, thank you very much for your time tonight. So let me find out from you, how would you assess the issue of withholding essential medical consumables at the port every now and then? Sometimes delaying, you know, treatment for patients like the ones we just saw on our screens a while ago. Yeah, thank you very much, um, host, um, and thanks to the audience. Um, I think that we have a lot of problems um, that is causing the issue, uh, the Kolibu, as um, the victims have narrated. It's very pathetic to see people um, that did not 
wish to be like the way they are, and then we see them suffering and maybe the help is not coming. I uh, sympathize with um, all of them. Now, uh, one problem is that um, there is a lot of challenges that come with uh, this international uh, sourcing or global uh, procurement. And um, we know that the equipment are not produced around uh, our country over here. Um, one of the reasons would be that um, th there are a lot of these problems now. We see our economic situation, exchange rate issues can be a problem. And so maybe Colebo is not able to uh, break up the resources to be able to procure uh, early enough. Sometimes, too, we have problems sourcing um, the partners that's identifying who is qualified. And even if we get the qualified people, um, how do we monitor the activities? And so we find that that will lead to maybe a very long lead time, which shouldn't have occurred. There are a lot of complexities, especially when we come to these global uh, purchases, mm. um, language issue, and so many others. And um, I also see a situation of that uh, vulnerability to opportunistic behaviors by some of our suppliers. Possible that they have identified some weak uh, places or some weak points in the system. And so they may intentionally uh, do that since they know that we may not even uh, be able to know what is going on. And then, like, still part of this uh, opportunistic behavior is true. Maybe there are people that are not qualified that are uh, undertaking this um, business. It should be people well, who know doc, how to do doc. international. Doc, my viewers would want to see you because you are on Zoom. We can hear you clearly, but oh, it looks like oh, your video oh, sorry, is off I so didn't kindly. Know that the yes. camera was off. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. All right. And so like I was, I was um, trying to explain about these opportunistic behaviors. Um, currently, you see that any project, anything that can come, we have heard about these um, sourcing problems. And so it's likely that maybe the one who used to um, supply uh, who does the importation that um, knew how to go about it um, has not, uh, the, maybe the, pre the contract has changed hands. And so you see that someone who has some shortfalls has been put around certain uh, problems or certain places. All right. Uh, where it basically may lack this uh, cultural and uh, uh, cross cultural issues and so on. So I think the solution, why and how we should. Uh, focus on solving it is that uh, we should have good communication mm. uh, among industry players and people who are involved in the supply chain procurement activities. Once we know when and what is going to happen at what time, I think that that problem can be solved. So, Information sharing is also another problem that we have as a country. And we need, uh, if only we are in to do business, then we should also be ready to share information with our partners so that these delays will not um, okay unnecessary. All right, Doc, we are sincerely grateful for your time tonight. You've spent time really to explain some of the procurement issues that could quickly be addressed. We were speaking to issues at the Colibu Renal Unit where patients don't seem to have confidence, but within the coming days, our cameras would be there. We'll make sure we tell you as it is, as and when consumables run out or as and when there are enough supply of consumables for the Renal Unit. In other stories tonight, the other Baka District Court 2 has remanded Constable Smith Jechi into police custody after he was arraigned on a provisional charge of murder. Well, this follows his alleged shooting of Stanley Ahaji, now deceased, over a disagreement on transport fares on August 18th at Kwan's Estate Gate near Kuntunse in the Gawest municipality. The mood at the Adabraka District Court 2 was a mix of somberness and anger during and after the proceedings. Reacting to what transpired in court, Yesuto Ahajiche, an aunt of Stanley Ahaji, now deceased, expressed hope that justice will be served. Well, it's, so, it's like it's part of the law. He's been charged and uh, is to be remanded to 9th of uh, September. We have to come back again. Since it's a proceeding, I'm sure it's the starting point. And then from there, we'll find out whether 
the procedure will change. Yesu to bemoaned the incident, saying, no one deserves to lose their life in such a tragic manner. She called on parents not to renege on their parental rules to safeguard against misconduct that brings perpetual pain to others. I think the greatest thing is patience and tolerance. If he had exercised a little bit of patience, he, he insisted on being paid. And I think twice, apart from the physical cash he was holding, he withdrew money from his wallet twice. But for the sake of 35 cities left, while begging him, then he shot him in the head. We need patience and self-discipline. Parents should try hard and groom their children as they grow to learn to be tolerant. The accused is on a provisional charge of murder and remanded into police custody to allow for more investigations into the case and will reappear in court on September 9, 2024. Right, so tonight we would move on to other stories very shortly, but we just want to assure you that if it's about politics, then definitely this is your election hub. We make sure we deliver on all the political stories that you're looking forward to.
Well, President Nanadu Dankwa Kufuadu has reaffirmed his commitment to yielding to the will of the Ghanaian people after the December 7th polls. Well, his comments comes in the wake of demands from the opposition NDC for the president to openly declare that they will, he will hand over power in the event of the governing MPP losing the upcoming elections. But speaking at the 12th Quadrilineal Congress of the Trade Union Congress on Tuesday, President Nanaro Dankwa Kufuado stressed his readiness to ensure a free, fair and peaceful elections. Well, he added that he will yield to the will of the people and not of any desperate politician. As we approach the electioneering season, I want to assure you that Ghana will emerge peaceful and more united after the 7th December elections. However, we must not allow complacency to set in, given the insecurity within West Africa. We have a duty to partner with and support our security and intelligence agencies to prevent any threats to the peace we enjoy. We must work diligently to secure our borders and maintain peace and security during this critical period. I have been and will always be for peace. And I encourage all citizens and organizations to do the same by rejecting the threats of misinformation and disinformation. I will help ensure the conduct of free, fair, credible, and transparent, freely expressed and not the will of any candidate or political party, however desperate for power, that will prevail. The, the integrity of our electoral process is paramount, and we will take all necessary steps to secure it. The law against vigilantism will be strictly applied without fear or favor, ensuring that peace and order are maintained throughout the electoral period enabling the Ghanaian people to make their choice free of intimidation and violence. Ghana's standing as a beacon of democracy in Africa will be sustained, and we will continue to set an example for other nations to follow. In these challenging times, we must unite, innovate, and act decisively to guarantee the interests of our workers and build a resilient economy. All right, so you have the president there. Now the opposition NDC has been up in arms with the National Peace Council over what they say is the lack of fairness in the council's dealings. Well, the party accuses the Peace Council of looking on unconcerned for crimes that occurred in the 2020 elections to go unpunished. Well, they have therefore declared their intention not to sign the election peace accord this year if six conditions are not met. But what really are these conditions? Now let's stay a while longer and speak to the opposition NDC's Director of Conflict Resolution, Abraham Amaleba, for more on this particular story. Well, um, Abraham Amaleba, thank you very much for your time. Uh, tonight, I want to find out from you. So what happens if all that you are demanding is not met by the National Peace Council. Won't this send a wrong signal to your support base uh, throughout the country? Good evening to you and to your viewers. Let me say that our support base is in support of our stand. Don't forget that the eight people who were killed in the last election were our supporters. Today, their relatives are asking why haven't they had justice? And so, moving into the 2024 election, if these things are not addressed, I am sure, and already we are receiving commendations from our supporters for the stance we have taken against the Peace Council. Abraham Amaleba, you, you seem to have trust issues with the National Peace Council. Another school of thought believe that, look, over the years they have served us well. Why do you have all these issues, all these trust issues with the Peace Council? It is the NDC that established the Peace Council 
So the NDC will be interested in ensuring that the Peace Council succeeds. However, if members of the Peace Council have not conducted themselves in a way that would suggest to all of us, including the NDC, that they are fair and just in dealing with issues that come before them. We cannot fold our up. If you look at our sixth uh, proposal or condition for what, they are not for the benefit of the NDC alone. They are for the benefit of the entire democratic process, including the MPP. Where there's violence, MPP members who will die. So we are not asking for anything which is, a, which is difficult to, 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 to get. We say, prosecute those who did the killing. Is that difficult? Why should even the opposition be the one interested in calling on the government to prosecute wrongdoers? And so the media should rather join us. Because what? You are at the branches, police stations, and then the coalition centers reporting a bullet doesn't know who is a journalist. So we are calling for the safety of all those who will be at the polling stations on the election day. And so let's punish those who did the wrong thing in the last election. So that if there are others who want to do the same thing, they will think twice. Well, um, Mr. Amaleba, I mean, we were... We were um, all worried when it came from the NDC quarters, look, we would not sign. When the MPP, uh, some faithfuls also came up that, look, we would equally uh, take our stance. I mean, uh, in fact, ECOWAS have even come up to say that, look, they suspect violence in the December polls, amongst others. But now, the president has publicly declared his willingness to respect the will of the people after the December 7th election. Are you satisfied? Because yes, the man has come out to say, look, if the NDC wins, I'll give it to them. If the MPP wins, I'll give it to them. I respect the will of the people. However, not any desperate politician who is seeking power. Are you satisfied with this? Never in the history of this country has a president made comments which suggest that the president is interested in chaos. This same president said that he was going to hand over only to the vice president, his preferred candidate. We didn't hear the media lambasting him. We didn't hear the peace council uh, 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 advising him. His members of his, of his government have made similar comments. Brian Champo is an example. There's one guy at the, uh, at the presidency who is in charge of operations, also made those comments. And so what we are saying is that you don't make comments to the effect that you are committed to peace when the TUC or any institution invite you to come and address them, then you hide behind that invitation and, and make comments that suggest that you are a, a man of peace. This president has never been a man of peace. When the eight people were killed, has he visited those people? Yeah, the relatives of those people, have they visited them? Has he compensated them? He says he's a man of peace. Nana Akupado is not a man of peace. Mm. So we want him, want him to use a platform and address the nation, a national platform and address the nation, not to hide behind people's invitations and speak to the nation that he would ensure that he superintends the election in such a way that there will not be violence again. Abraham Mamaliba, thank you very much. We're grateful for your time. You've made the pointers clear, and I'm sure 
all have heard and would act accordingly. Meanwhile, a member of the National Peace Council, Juan Opare, says the NDC's position on the peace pact calls for a new strategy to deal with the impasse. Speaking to the media during a public forum on media peace and democracy consolidation organized by the Media Foundation for West Africa in collaboration with the Peace Council, Juan Opare said the Peace Council will continue to mediate between the political parties to find a lasting solution to the concerns of election violence. Available data indicates a growing media over the last two decades in Ghana. While the growth is significant for media diversity and amplifying citizen voices for public accountability, a substantial number of these media houses are owned by politicians who use them for political propaganda to further their partisan interests, to help contribute to addressing the above contest and advance peaceful elections and democratic consolidation in Ghana, the Media Foundation for West Africa, with support from the U.S. Embassy in Ghana, is implementing a project titled Enhancing the Media's Role in Conflict Resolution, Peace Building, and Democratic Consolidation in Ghana. Suleiman Abraima is the Executive Director of the Media Foundation for West Africa. Our politicians are spewing out, you know, in, in some instances, vile um, rhetoric, pro-violent rhetorics, um, hate speech sometimes, propaganda sometimes, misinformation sometimes, disinformation sometimes, and all of that. We didn't allow ourselves to be conveyor belts, basically conveying whatever politicians are saying to the people, and we shouldn't also be allowed to be used as megaphones, basically blaring out um, whatever is being said by politicians whether good or bad. Engaging journalists on the issue of the refusal of the NDC to sign the peace pact, member of the Peace Council, Joanna Pari, emphasized the need for a new strategy to bring the NDC on board and a continuous engagement with the political class to ensure a peaceful election. This is a new thing, I should say, that has come up from the NDC and we have just begun putting in place strategies that we can use in mediation and talking to them to see where we will get to. We will use what, in line with our mandates, we can use whatever strategies we can put in place to ensure that there's a common understanding and we have everybody's concerns addressed. During a panel discussion for journalists and representatives of political parties, Head of the political decks of GH1 TV and Star FM, Ibrahim Al Hassan, called out politicians who micromanage media houses for their reportage. Traditional leaders have not become politicians themselves. And other, the other flip side of the coin is that when they say certain things to the politicians, when they visit their palaces, the politicians now have media outlets. They write their own stories. They write their own stories and circulate those stories, and those stories get published unedited. So I'm sure many of you who read newspapers will see synchronized headlines. Chances are they are all from politicians. The forum brought together stakeholders in the media, chiefs, students, CSOs, to help increase public awareness about the challenges of hate speech and toxic narratives and their implication for Ghana's democracy, peace, and stability. In other stories tonight, the Children's Ministry of the Divine Healers Church are appealing to political actors to ensure their actions do not disturb the peace of the country before, during, and after the December 7th elections. Well, according to them, peace cannot be sacrificed for political gains as this has a tendency to disrupt their education as well as hinder the propagation of the gospel of Christ. Well, the calls were made by the children of Redeemers Movement or of the Divine Healers Church as they marked their 70th anniversary celebrations of the church. There's more in the following report. Jesus Christ yes, is calling us for prayer for salvation. Am I in the Children's and Redeemers Movement Conference 
brought together participants from Tema and Ashaimam, who mimicked adults in the sharing of the Word of God. The children used the occasion to pray for peace ahead of the 2024 general elections. Speaking with GH1 News on the sidelines of the event, 14-year-old Antoinette Mensah, who delivered the sermon, said, Since every religion preaches peace, there is a need to approach every activity, including political processes, with peace. We chose this team because we know that some people are still living in darkness. So we decided to preach this theme for those that are living in the darkness to come to their light. This year is an election year. They shouldn't do anything that will have a negative effect on our education or, or have a negative effect on their life. They should just put their faith in God because through Christ we can do all things. When there is any violence, it will stop us from preaching. National Chairman of the Children and Redeemers Movement of the Church, Reverend Prince Samuel Asante Dakum, urged parents to take a keen interest in what the awards consume on the internet. The internet is very, very good. But people are using it for what? Negative purposes. So it behoves on every parent to sit the child down and let the child know the merits and the demerits of the internet, which is being taught at the at church. In fact, when the children come, we take them through the demerits and the demerits of what? The internet. The news team caught up with some participants and they had this to say. This is also to my dear parents and adults who are above the age of 18 years. Um, this year we are in the election year. So I'm urging you all to vote well. I was if there is any violence, it's going to affect with the children. There should not be any any conflict. There should be peace among all of us so that we can vote and get the president. I urge you all to vote to vote wisely so that it won't cause any violence in this country. Otherwise it will affect with the children. All right, so those are some updates there from our local front. Well, we're back shortly with some more. Do stay with us, but I'll close it for the election hub. Right, so if you're just joining us, this is News Tonight on GH1 TV. Let's do some more stories on politics. Now let's do some constituency-focused stories now in the high-stick show, showdown that could tip the balance of the power in Parliament. The Ablekuma North constituency has become a battleground where the MPP and the NDC candidates are locked in a fierce fight for dominance. Well, as the 2024 general elections approached, the once predictable seat has turned into a political tender box, so with both parties pulling out all the stops in a bid to secure a decisive victory. Well, in the following report, GH1 News' is Obed King Gaglo puts the spotlight on Ablekuma North constituency and the prospects of the parliamentary candidates in the area. The Ablekuma North constituency has been in existence since 1992. Areas under the jurisdiction of Ablekuma North include Kwashiman, Odoko, Dakuman Kokompe, Nyameche, and parts of Dansuman. It has been a stronghold of the MPP since 1996. Kwame Nabatels has been the constituency's longest serving MP until 2008 when Justice Joe Apia took over from him and later defeated Ras Mubarak of the NDC in 2012. In 2016, Nana Ekuya Owusu Efriye represented the MPP in parliament but subsequently lost to Sheila Bartels, the daughter of Kwame Bartels, during the MPP primaries 
for the 2020 parliamentary elections and is currently the MP for the area. But here is the interesting twist of events. Nana Ekuya Owusu Efriye, who lost to the incumbent MP Sheila Bartels, has staged a strong comeback by beating Sheila Bartels in the MPP primaries to be the parliamentary candidate for the 2024 elections. Though the MPP has dominated the political landscape in the area, some constituents who spoke to the news team say they are unhappy with the performance of the MPP. Some taxi drivers at the Kwashima taxi station in an interview served notice that they will not vote for the MPP this time round because they believe the MPP have taken constituents for granted. They cited poor roads and many other unfulfilled promises. Including the parliamentary seats for the 2024 elections in the Ablikuma North constituency will be keenly contested by the MPP's Nana Ikuya Wusui Friye and the NDC's Irabna Obin, who are matching each other boot for boots with billboards scattered at vantage points in the constituency. In an interview with the NDC's parliamentary candidates, Irabna Obin called out the MPP for turning a blind eye to the plights of constituents and described their track record as abysmal. Cast your mind back years back, the constituency hasn't progressed or it hasn't improved. No, nothing, nothing seems to be better. A Blackman of constituency is a problematic one. Yes, the other party that is the inconsiderate NPP has been in power for nearly 30 years. Rooms. Nothing works. Nothing works in this constituency. Look at our road networks. And so if MPP has been in power for nearly 30 years and we have nothing useful to boast about, then your guess should be as good as mine. Although the news team engaged the MPP parliamentary candidate for an interview, the attempt proved unsuccessful. With over 30,000 votes difference between the NDC and the MPP in the 2020 elections, can the NDC bridge this gap and possibly win the Ablikuma North seat for the first time? Well, 7 December is just around the corner. Reporting for GH1 News, Obed Kingaglo, Ablikuma North. And my name is Kweku Timi, live at the Platinum Place. It's now time for us to get you the latest from our world of business. We're we'll back shortly with more. The business segment is brought to you by Bills Microcredit Limited. Well, in business tonight, the Okada business, despite its controversial nature, has offered financial stability, dignity, and purpose to countless individuals. Yet the debate over the legality and societal impact continues to rage on. Now, this report, we hear directly from those who rely on this trade, exploring the vital role it plays in their lives and why they believe it deserves recognition and support. In the face of rising unemployment, one profession has become a beacon of hope for millions of Ghanaians. The Okada business has grown to become more than just a means of getting from one place to another. 
It's an industry that sustains livelihoods, empowers families, and builds communities. I believe this is what I think I do. I build my four bedrooms of contain. And I have nine children. Two children are university. And four as secondary uh, schools. But this Okada, I retain the take care of them. The Okada industry is not just a casual hassle. It's a well-organized sector with regional and local executives working together to protect their interests. As the business expands, riders are pushing for recognition and regulation, highlighting their potential contribution to national revenue if legalized and formalized. They should just look at this number of people in this business. Today, people are calling that they should legalize marijuana, they should legalize weed and other things. People are even forming a lines that they should allow them to do homosexual. That is even against the laws of our God, the creator of the universe and all that. If we can put things in place, I tell you, it will be one of the branches that the government will get revenue and other things from. Despite being stigmatized, Okada Dryders insist that their work is legitimate and necessary, especially in a country grappling with unemployment. They argue that if neighboring countries like Togo, Benin, Ivory Coast, and Nigeria have successfully integrated motorcycle transport into their economies, Ghana can do the same. So we don't see why it's becoming like a taboo. We don't know why it's like uh, it's a scene of doing it here. So we are we are telling them they should just look at the number of people who are here. A nation where youth unemployment is a growing concern. Okada riders claim their numbers far exceed those in government employment programs. They believe their contribution to the economy is undeniable and that with proper regulation, they could be an even greater asset. The unemployment rate in Ghana today, I'm talking about 2 million people. We are not joining the unemployment association that government to find job for us. But we ourselves have created a job. So the government of the day or any government to sit with us. For those riders, Okada isn't just a job. It's a path to financial independence, self-respect, and community stability. But without government support and legal recognition, they fear their efforts will continue to be dismissed as an underground economy. Peter Kwao Adato's report for GH1 News. Another business story tonight, Ghana loses an estimated $23.7 million annually to illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. Well, to address this, fishmongers and fisherfolk are advocating for amendments to the Fisheries Act 2002, Act 602. Well, this initiative spearheaded by the Environmental Justice Foundation, that's EJF, and the Sustainable Oceans Project, that's SOP, is leading engagements in four coastal areas of the country. There's more in the following reports. At a recent joint advocacy workshop, members of the Ghana National Canoe Fishermen Council and the National Association of Fish Processors and Traders discussed the need for comprehensive legal reforms. The workshop emphasized the importance of a unified approach to push for changes to the country's fisheries laws. The Fisheries Act 2002 regulates fishing methods, establishes fishing zones and licenses fishing vessels. However, illegal practices like psycho and the use of monofilament nets persist. The Act is being reviewed to introduce harsher penalties to combat IUU fishing and ensure sustainable fishing. Stakeholders are focused on strengthening enforcement mechanisms and introducing heavier penalties to deter illegal activities. Araba Ewabwating is the advocacy manager for the Environmental Justice Foundation. She explains the initiative aims to push for stricter penalties to deter non-compliant individuals. For some time now, we, we are all thinking about how the laws, the fishes laws can be reviewed. And we have been working around it for some time now. But as we speak, the laws have been a review. A draft has been brought out. So now we want our stakeholders, to especially the grassroots stakeholders, to come together to have one voice so that they can push, we can push this agenda. National Chief Fisherman and Chairman of the Ghana National Canoe Fisherman Council is optimistic the initiative would make greater impact 
in the fishing industry. Because of the nature of the sea, without borders, you know, our activities impact on our uh, neighboring countries, and therefore, you know, most of the laws are ratified by maybe the sub region or the region, or you know, globally. You understand? So we are we are treating most of the issues between the industry on global, regional, and sub regional. There's no more a national issue where you think that the sea belongs to you. And therefore, you know, we can do what and, and as we like the no. So that's about all we have for you in business tonight. Special thanks to Bill's Microcredit for making it possible for us to bring you business. When we come back, we have some sports updates for you. Well, welcome on to Sports Director for National Sports Authority. That's the NSA, Doji Nemu Kevo. As the bank reports making the waves on social media that the pitch at the Commercial Sports Stadium is in a deplorable state, two weeks ahead of hosting the Nations Cup qualifier between Ghana and Angola in September. Speaking in an interview on the game on GH1 TV and Star FM, the NSA boss revealed that the pitch will be ready in time for the qualifier in September. Well, that's not the current stage. You see, when, when an event is held at the stadium on the grass, it takes a while for fast people. And we were taking steps to reclaim the pitch and to recover it back to its normal state. So I don't think the pictures that people are trying to change is the true picture of what the situation is at the moment. If I heard you right, you are saying that the pictures trending currently is not the current state of the pitch as we speak today in Kumase. No, it's not. That's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. So in two weeks' time, the stars are going to be in Kumasi for the game against Angola. How prepared yeah. is the venue for that fixture? That's what I'm saying that, look, even when, even when a, a, a pitch is ready for a match, when the teams go for halftime, when they are on break, you still have to water, sometimes you still have to mow the grass. Okay, so as for pitch preparation, it's not an event, it is a process. Mm. And that process is ongoing and will be ready for Angola come the 5th of September 2024. So no cause of concern has been expressed by some Ghanaians after seeing those images? I mean, look, you see, we live in a country where we all know there are highlings, there are mercenaries out there who jump onto Facebook to do anything to cause mischief. So we are aware of these things. It's normal. You know. Now, the NSA boss further justified the move of the authorities to be renting out the stadium for non sporting activities and concerts. Explain this on the game, you revealed that that's how the NSA resort uh, to means of raising revenue or funds to the maintenance of the pitches, payment of utility bills, amongst others, at the national stadium. But all over the world, whether you go to Wembley, whether you go to the Emirates, whether you go to Bayern Munich Stadium, the stadium is let out to other organizations mm. to do activities. It can be rugby, it can be musical concerts. Musical concerts are being held at Wembley Stadium in the UK every day, okay? The most important thing is that when those events are held, you get the whole stadium back in shape for whatever game you have in hand. It is done everywhere. Now, you see, a lot of people tend to think that, oh, NSA cannot manage the facilities they are using for church services. If you're going to, you see, teams come to play. Mm -hmm. And let me make this point clear. In the UK and the advanced countries, whether you are Arsenal or you are Tottenham, they all have stadiums to themselves. They, are, they own the stadiums where they play. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. To, to, to manage such facilities, you need a lot of money. So, for example, if you're going to play a typical league game, you have to power the genset. You have to buy fuel for the generator set. You have to turn on the taps to, to, to be able to, to run all the, the toilet facilities in the stadium. You have to buy toilet food. You have to buy soap. And you have to buy a whole lot of things. NSA pays for all of that. Mm -hmm. The teams do not pay virtually nothing. Where are we going to get money to be paying for all of that? Mm -hmm. And the teams expect to come and play. And when they play, people drink water, sachet water, bottled water. They drink yogurt. They do all kinds of things. When they leave, how do we clear the rubbish before they come in for the next game? 
Mm. Fine. So but if you don't do all these ones, if you don't do all these events, where is the NSA going to get money to run the stadium? People are saying that, oh, all our stadium facilities are in that dilapidated state. Last week, Sunday, in Swatraman played a team from Chad. Mm. The stadium was certified. It was declared fit for that calf match. So are we saying that in Swatraman played on a dilapidated pitch or in a stadium that is dilapidated? And that's it for sport. Back to Goku for the rest of the bulletin. Right, so thank you very much, Benghazi, for your time tonight. And we know definitely he is going to join us tomorrow with some more updates from our world of sports. Well, we want to appreciate you at home for staying with us throughout the bulletin. Indeed, we've enjoyed our one-hour period with you. And we're looking forward to sharing more interesting programs with you right on this channel. Bulletin led by Musa Lansa. On behalf of the entire production team tonight, we'd want to salute you and say a big thank you to you. Ensure you bring the family together and you brush with Pepsodent. My name is Kwe Kwe Timin. A very good evening to you.